Good morning, everyone, and welcome on into day four of ClayShare Con. Wow, I can't believe we're already at day four. We've got an amazing lineup planned for you today, and we're going to start right off with some modern Mishima tutorial. Um, I'm going to be doing that for you all. So this is one of my favorite things to do. I did a Sgraffito tutorial two days ago, and carving in clay is my favorite thing to do. Like we all have things we, we like to do when we're making pottery. Some people it's, you know, making forms. Some people it's putting on handles. Yes, people like to put on handles. For some people it's glazing. There's lots of things we all have that are our favorite things. And for me, it's carving. And that would be Sgraffito, which is where we scratch away the surface, or Mishima, where we carve a line and then we fill it in to create an inlay. So those, th those are my loves. And those are the things I've done the longest, I think, and I'm probably the best at because I've done it so much. So I'm gonna share with you the creating the inlay technique. And I'm gonna show you some of my finished pieces. Now, we're gonna take our clay and we're gonna carve a design into it. And then we're gonna fill that with another color. And you can fill it with any color you want. And then we'll wipe back the excess and we'll have a beautiful design. And you can leave it as just a line drawing and it's beautiful or you can fill it in with color. I like to fill them in with color and here's one that I did. I don't know if we wanna go how that is on the, the front camera, we'll just figure it out. So each line you see was hand carved and then filled in with color once it's been bisque fired. Now you, it took me about eight hours to carve this. Yes, I know, that's crazy. But you don't have to do that. Here's another one I did, it's a little simpler. It's this beautiful little wildflower pattern. I think I got another similar, this little bowl right here. A little similar technique right here on this little bowl. Now you keep it really simple and you can do wide swatches of color first, then you're carving through and just fill it with one color. And so you get this really great look, but you don't have to spend all the time filling each bit in. There's a lot of, a lot of time. Oh, let's show this one. This has got mother of pearl on it, so it's highly reflective. Might be difficult for you all to see. Here's another one I did that doesn't have the mother of pearl. You can put lettering on your Mishima. You can carve anything you want. Yeah, the egg tray was really fun to, to carve. So that's my personal egg tray. I kept this one. That's the one we use in our house every like week because my family loves deviled eggs. I've also got some plates to show. And again, the line, I carved it and then I filled it with blue underglaze and then wiped back the excess and you know, signed the back too. So you can see it. Yes, it has luster on it. We're lustering tomorrow. I'll have a luster tutorial and we'll talk more about that. But I think we should go to a um, camera two. I think we should go there because I can really get in and you can see the detail. So that each and every, I think this one really shows, each and every line is, is carved by hand. I'll show that there. So this piece here is one of my soldier series. This is part of that series, but it's a little different with the grenades. And again, I mentioned the other day that if you want to know more about my artwork, go to jessicaputnamphillips.com. Yes, I am Clay Share, and most of you know me for that, but um, I have been making pot, you know, pottery for over 20 years. I've been an artist for over 30 years. So, well, I would say longer, my whole life, but you can check that out. All right, so this is an urn I made for my beloved Evie, my Yorkshire Terrier that passed away. <sighs> and uh, I haven't finished it yet. I have to do the color, but you can see what we get to, right? So here's one that hasn't had its color added to it. Here's one that has had its color added to it. So you can see the, all the line work and all the detail that's in this piece. And here's a couple more. So I wanna show you, I'm showing you these, the kind of in-betweens. This is bisque. So you carve it on greenware and then you bisque fire it, then you add your color. So this is a cherry blossom design that I did that I have to add color to. We were talking, do I always do uh, leaves and stuff? No, here's a really fun swirly whirly thing that I did. And then here's one just playing with different patterning and everything. And so you can see they don't have a color yet, but I'll add the color later. Okay, I've got other pieces we could just talk forever, 
Um, color wise, you know, here's one that I did highly colored with mother of pearl luster on it. So you can see there's a lot happening in this piece here. Okay. Y'all ready? Because, oh, and oh, birds. I do carve birds once in a while. Now I have a class on Clayshare to teach you how to do Mishima. If you want more step-by-step, -step, we don't have enough time to really go into it. And because it's a live format for ClayshareCon, there's a lot of questions. But I show you how you can take a drawing of your own or an image you have and then trace it onto the surface and get that exact image. So this bird right here is one I drew by hand on paper. And then I used plastic to trace over and then used that plastic on this to create a little indentation so that I knew where to carve. So it gave me a guideline, so this is great. I did a series of these, oh gosh, like five years ago. Um, I haven't made any sense. I should make some birds. I should do some spring birds. Maybe for Open Studio Weekend, I will. All right, so what do you need for some tools? Well, you're gonna need a leather hard pot. Magic! I've got a leather hard pot. So I threw some pieces the other day and here's a mug that I made and I'm going to show you step one with the leather hard pot. Now you're going to want to carve into your surface. And when I first started carving, I think you all remember I talked about how I used a needle tool. And you can, by all means, use needle tools, also called a pin tool, let me get one, to carve with. But this is not a great carving tip. It's just, it's really rough. It tends to tear the surface. You don't get great results with this, but it does work. I know because I carved for goodness gracious, five years with this, um, and, they, and they, they do work. There are other carving tools out there. I know uh, Kemper has some and other companies do, but my favorites, when I discovered these, they changed my life. These are diamond core tools, diamond stylus tools, and my favorite is the L3, which is a small football, large football, and the L2, which is a little ball and a crown. So these are the ones that I carve the most with when I'm doing Mishima. And I don't use the like V-tip carvers that I was sharing the other day during Scraffito because those will create a big line and I don't want a big line, you want a fine line. So what else we got? Uh, you want a brush. So here's, a, this is actually Mishima in here. This is a second, I had to keep this because look, I got a little dot of cobalt inside. That would be, awful for someone to have to suffer with that little blue dot inside their cup. So I kept this to save you all from suffering with this cup, because that would be terrible. I would hate that. A little brush, because we're going to brush away crumbs again, and then a foam, little foam sponge brush. And then some wax, and I'll explain why we're going to use wax. This is the same product. They are two different colors. It's Mr. Mark's Wax On. I get it from the ceramic shop. Sheffield Pottery has it as well. Other distributors might sell it. It's a water-based wax, and what I love about this is you want a wax that dries hard but not brittle. And you don't want it to crack, and you don't want it to be mushy. And it's hard to find a good wax that works. Forbes wax works pretty well. Um, there's some other companies that make good waxes, but a lot of waxes are too gummy for this to work, and they can be problematic. So if you've tried this technique and you try to carve and it's just mush, probably because the wax is not a good fit for you. Lisa, would have, you would have suffered. You would have suffered with that, huh? <laughs> so what would I use the crown end for? Lisa, I carve a bigger line with it. Yeah, it just gives you a different line. Well, I'm gonna make some more cups like this for Open Studio Weekend and other people can suffer with them. Uh, I, I'll try not to get blue dots in them, but anyhow, if I do, you, uh, if you're willing to suffer, I'll. I'll let you have it. Okay, so let's talk a bit about Mishima and what it is. Mishima is a style of pottery that was developed in Japan and the region, um, there's a region in Japan known for Mishima pottery. And traditionally Mishima was done with a blade and they would carve the tiniest, finest little line into their pottery. They would inlay it with a slip which would be made with the clay and then a bit of an oxide, usually cobalt. You'll see a lot of it done with the blue and white. And then on the line, you have you know, you're covered with all this color. You have to scrape back. So they would scrape back the surface. 
The problem with that is, you know, you get a lot of unevenness if you're not very good at it. And you can scrape too far down and then you lose your beautiful drawing that you just incised. So I do this modern Mishima technique and there's a lot of potters doing this. This is not new. I've been doing it for over a decade, maybe, maybe 15 years now. Um, I don't remember anymore. You know, once you start making pottery and years go by, you forget and then you realize, holy cats, I've been doing this that long. So by applying wax to a leather hard surface, we're setting the surface up, one, to dry evenly, but two, to make a surface that will resist the color. So the only area that the color is going to go into is where we carve. So it saves material and it's easy to just wipe back with a sponge. So let's get started. You're going to take your leather hard pot. I threw this yesterday, trimmed it, believe it or not, early, early this morning and put my handle on early this morning. Now, if you wanted to add color to the surface, you want to do that after you trim it, if it's a mug or if it's a bowl or whatever you have when it's leather hard. You can do this on wheel thrown pottery, you can do it on hand built pottery, you can do it on low fire, high fire, mid range clay, doesn't matter. The um, key thing, as I mentioned with this graffito as well, is that you want a smooth clay body and we're working with contrasts. So if you are going to carve a line in here and then inlay it, we have a light clay body. If you inlay the light clay with a white line, you'll barely see it. If you're working with porcelain, it'll be even less noticeable. So you want a darker line, at least the mid-tone or darker. If you're using a dark clay like a Laguna 60, which is a really nice, Laguna 80, I'm sorry. 80 is a really nice, smooth, dark clay. Then you could do a light colored line to mid-tone. I wouldn't go um, any darker because if you go too dark, again, you won't see your lines. So just think about that when you're making and you, you know, terracotta, it works great with terracotta, dark red clay, beautiful terracotta, use a white line. If you're using white earthenware, use a black or a darker line. Okay, so that's a bit about the, the contrast situation. If you want to add color to it, you add it before the wax. You can add it after as well. But if you want a background like I created here, what I did is I brushed on these. This is actually Amico. I believe I used Amico's on this. Can't quite remember. It might be Speedball or Amico. But this is a teal, like maybe this is Aqua. No, this is Speedball Aqua and Chartreuse. Aqua Chartreuse. So I just did some watered down washes on the leather hard clay and I just brushed it on let it dry and you can see there's spaces in between. It's not perfectly applied. They're just little stripes. Then you apply your wax over the color and let it dry. Alternatively, you know, you could put wax on, on the lip and on the foot like I did on this bowl or you can add, I mean, underglaze or you can add underglaze after it's bis fired. So once you wax it, you cannot put color over the wax until after it's bisque. The wax is going to resist. You can only carve. So I just wanted to go over that. Oh yeah, and this picture I made, same kind of technique as the cup, put the colors on first, then the wax, then did the carving. So it just gives you another, other options. And those are great because it's simple, it's a good place to start if you're just um, getting going. All right, back to the waxes. I saw some comments about the colors. It's the same product, they changed the color of it. Sometimes you get pink, sometimes you get purple. But it's the same. I found the pink tended to be a bit thicker, so I'd have to thin it with a little bit of water, about 80% wax, 20% water. Purple is perfect. You do not have to thin it at all. You just use it straight out of the bottle. So just it's like something to think about. Um, for continuity's sake, since I've been using the purple on the piece I'm going to carve, we'll go with purple. I like to use a foam brush going to dip it in water first. This is the same foam brush I've been using for a while now. They will last and last and last and last and last. You just keep rinsing them out. Um, and then, you know, eventually they wear out and, and you're done with the brush. You could save the handle and do some stamping with it or use it for other tool purposes. It's a little dowel, but they last a, a good long time. And, you know, I do feel bad about using a thing that I eventually throw away, but I feel like the amount of use this gets, it's all right. In a brush, if I bought a brush, it would cost more and I would probably destroy it just as fast, if not faster. Now, you should have a little container to pour your wax out in because this is my big complaint right here. 
this tiny little nozzle. So let's see, if you put under glaze on and then wax and carve, do you only fire once? No, it's a double fire process because this is leather hard. We're gonna wax it and carve it, and then we're gonna bisque fire and then add color and fire it again. I would not recommend this for a single fire process, no. I would definitely do two because you can't glaze it. You got wax on it. Although you could use stroke and coats and that's a glaze product. All right, so yes, you can fit these little foam brushes down inside these bottle, tiny little bottles, but ideally you want to use a container to pour it into. And then just gonna brush it on the surface. I usually start on the bottom because you know we're gonna wanna sit it on the bottom and that will dry the fastest. Sometimes it'll take a little while to dry. So I'll do most of the outside and then not the rim and I'll just turn it upside down. Let me just add this before I go any further. This is your best chance for cleaning up all of your, your pieces and parts of your leather hard pot. So if you have any marks on your handle you wanna smooth out on your rims, give it a quick cleaning up so that it's in good condition. Cause you're not gonna wanna go back and sand this. You're gonna have carved it and you don't wanna sand over your carving. You could sand some of it out. I'm making a little mess with my bottle, but it happens. This is actually great to do on mugs because a lot of times folks have difficulty with the handles cracking. And I have a little I think, free tutorial on how to, how to prevent cracking on your handles. And one of my tips is wax them like I'm doing right now. You could just wax the handle. You don't have to wax the whole piece and where it attaches like around here. And what that does is it helps slow the drying time. When you think about your handle, it's sticking out in the air. It's drying really fast and sometimes they dry too fast and they try to pop off your mug. So what you wanna do is slow that drying time down and help let the clay dry more evenly. So if you put wax on your handle, it can do that for you. All right, so you see how if I sit it down, I'm gonna make a little ring. It's all right, we'll do that. But normally I would sit it upside down and I would just go ahead and wait for the bottoms to dry enough so I can flip it over. Now I'm gonna wax down inside a bit and this is because as I'm holding it, if I have any black underglaze on my hand, which sometimes we make messes in studios, shocking, I know. Um, if I'm putting my hand in here with black underglaze, I don't really wanna get it on the inside of my rim. Also, you might decide you wanna carve inside there. So it's nice to have it prepped up. All right, once that's done, just rinse your brush off, squeeze it out, let it dry, and it's good to go for the next thing you're gonna wax. All right, I'm just gonna put this to the side. This wax is water soluble, so it's easy to clean up if you spill it and make a mess, which I do that sometimes, I make messes. All right, back to carving, what do we got today? I have a bowl. So Barbara says, thanks to the, my past videos, you do a lot of carving now. I love that, I love that you're doing carving. I think people are afraid to carve into their pottery because you make a piece and it's like, aha, I've got this gorgeous piece. It's perfect. I don't want to mess it up. But you gotta, you gotta mess it up. You gotta go further, right? So you have to, you have to do that. So I'm gonna grab, I just said, did I just check that plastic that I needed? What am I doing? All right, the plastic I had wrapped, I'm gonna use to catch all the crumbs that we're gonna make because like Scrofito, Mashima is a crummy technique. <laughs> crummy. All right. <laughs> I'm going to get the Insta Hi, everybody. I'm going to get the Instagram folks so that they get a better view so that they can see the carving. So you can put this up on, I have a foam like chunk, but you could just use a sheet of foam, egg crate. Um, if you buy pyrometric cones, they come in a little box that has a tiny bit of, of foam, which works great for mugs. But um, bigger pieces like this, you might want a bigger sheet of foam. And so here's a bowl that has been waxed. I waxed it yesterday. So this does take a little time and preparation ahead because I threw the bowl one day, trimmed it the next day, waxed it the same day I trimmed it, and then carve it the day after that. So it's not a make it the same day and carve it. 
with wheel throwing. Hand-built bowl, you could build a bowl or mug or vase or whatever you're going to make one day, let it set up enough, the next day wax it, and then carve it the day after. All right, so I think I'm going to go ahead and do a little pattern on this. And I'm not going to do leaves because everybody was like, you, do you always do leaves? I don't always do leaves. I do other things too. So I thought we would do something more like this. This is really fun. This is just a free form little spirally geometric thing happening. So we'll do that. So you're the most untalented person and you carve now and love it. It's, yes, it's very calming. So think about it drawing pen on paper, except it's actually easier to carve a pot than draw on a piece of paper. So a question, how do I clean the foam after? Uh, I'm using a piece of plastic. Do you see how I have plastic between the foam? And you don't have to worry about getting bits of clay in your, in your foam. You just go ahead and use the plastic and that prevents it. So it's not, it's not a big deal. This is good and I'm going to show it to you because you don't have to pre-plan at all. This is very spontaneous. And we just are going to start and make a curve like a letter C, you keep spiraling around. Now you could just do little spirals, right? And, and just do that little spirally technique. But I went to the end and then now I'm gonna come back on it. Making a, um, I use this for ferns a lot. This is a nice little fern. Now let's talk about the dryness of the clay. This is one of those techniques, if your clay is not dry enough, it will mush. So you want to make sure your clay, you will be able to tell when you carve through it, that the clay just crumbles off and falls away. Now, we wax this, so all the clay that we're carving here is encapsulated on one side with wax. So I'm not really worried about that being a dust hazard. I don't know if you want to do the overhead, it's probably better. So can you do this without the wax? You can absolutely do the same technique without the wax. The issue you have is when we go to do our inlay, the wiping back, you're going to have to wipe back a lot more. You're going to have more material absorbed by the clay. And then what tends to happen is you get some over wiping and you remove the design from your lines. Is there a coupon code for Diamond Core Tools on ClayShareCon? I believe we do have a discount from Diamond Core Tools. So let's go to the rim and do the exact same thing from the top. So I'm just carving back. So you just do your line out, come back, stop. I'm stopping here because I want to put another swirly in and I want it to join it here. But you don't have to. We're going to come kind of far down on this swirly. right up to the rim, and then go back and connect. So the pattern doesn't really pop until we add our color. Oh, from the wax. Oh, you meant from the wax. How do you get it out of the foam brush? It's water-based. It just rinses right out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a... Um, it's not a problem. It just rinses right out. So the more you do this, the more you will love it. And you will find as you are carving, new designs will be popping into your head. I find that I'll be carving a piece and I'll be like, ooh, what if I do this on my next one? So one leads to the next. So we've got some kind of funky, on two? Yeah. We've got some kind of funky, like, almost tree-ish things, sort of, ferny, botanical, you know. But you could just as easily just carve stripes. I mean, this right here, just do some stripes and then a simple little fern going up. Or like a, I call it a fern. It's just a little stem of some sort. But it's a very simple design, but it totally changes the cup. 
Let's do let's do with some more. So if you like really abstract designs, I think you'll fall in love with Mishima because it lends itself nicely to them. Let's do a couple more. We're only gonna have room for a couple more before we gotta move on to the next technique. Well, that's going to be the background filling, right? Ram's horns and curly elf shoes. Yes. Now, will I carve with the other two? Sure. We'll do that one in a sec. So this was the small football. Let me do uh, one with the large football line so you can see the different line quality. I was actually going to do the background with the big, so we'll save that. But here's this little one, and I'm going to use this for detail carving because it's so fine. So let me show you. See the fine lines I just did inside there? These lines right there. Let's do some coming up like this. So you can use this for shading. Little lines up in there. Uh, you can use it just to add little visual interest, texture, tiny elements to the piece. I'm going to put a swirly background, but there's nothing stopping me from putting something floral in here. So if I want to use the crown, I'm going to do the crown so you can see how that works. And I can show you the line difference. So look at the crown line. Do you see how one side's fatter and then it gets skinnier as we do it? So it's going to create a different line. You're going to have a line that is, because it's carved, fat on one side, thin on the other. So it's going to have a little more movement to it, potentially, than one that doesn't have that. And then switch around to the ball end. And you can do little tiny things in there. So I use my general carving, the L3, the small or the, or the big, just depends on what I'm doing. The um, crown I use mostly for when I'm doing a line that I want to have a little more movement to it. And then for fine detail work, I like the little ball. Now they have a, a couple other diamond stylus tools. I don't Again, have them on hand because I, I gave them all away. It's, it's what I do, give stuff away. But they're wonderful as well. I just find that these two meet all my needs. So, you know, you don't have to have everything out there. There's no need to buy every tool you see. What you need to do is figure out what you like to make and what you like to do and get those tools that'll work for your style of making. Let's use this one and we're just going to put some little tiny flowers coming up, petals coming off this one. So you can see in this little flower, it's very subtle, Let's see how close I can go. It's very subtle the differences. Here I use the little ball, here I use the crown, here I use the small football for that. So it's very subtle. But it makes a difference. You know, you always want to think about line quality when you're drawing and when you're carving because if you have the same line over and over, it gets boring. It's nice to have the variation of line. You know, it's the idea when we're making patterns and designs in our pottery, we want to keep the eye moving. You want to think of a pattern that flows, works not only with the pot, you know, around the pot, but up and down the pot. And you see how we have a little rhythm going here? You know, I have this piece here to this here, this there, and see how it's flowing around. And so there'll be visual movement to this piece, which is something you think about when you're making. And it can be as simple, as I said, as lines. So do I have a plan in my head? Uh, mm. <laughs> you can have a plan in your head. And you can have a drawing that you've made and you've figured out the math so it fits perfectly. 
I am not that way. I do everything kind of seat of my pants when it comes to carving. It's, but here's the thing about it. As you carve more, you get better at it and you kind of know what's gonna fit where and just how to make it work. So I'll do another little swirly. This one's not quite, so my clay is almost a little too wet for the carving, but it's, it's working. All right, back over in here. So the next part I do, and this is something you could do if you didn't do the swirlies at all or the florals, right? You just wanted to do a pattern and you weren't sure what you wanted to do. I would suggest you come in and you just make a circle. And the great thing about this, they don't have to be a perfect circle. Make a circle, a small circle and then you make a bigger circle around it, and then a bigger circle, right? So I made three rings there. Let's come over here and make a ring, a little circle, ring here, ring here, and then the third ring, and then what's gonna happen? Oh no, it bumped that. Well, that's what we want. We're creating a pattern that's gonna be responsive. It's gonna work with what's around it. So it creates a background pattern like I have on this one. So you see the swirlies, but you also see that background. I'm gonna switch, I wanted to use the larger end so I can get a bigger line. So it radiates out like ripples in a pond. Go back to this one. And so as we keep going with this circle here, especially, you know, we just have a line here and then a line over here and a line there, another line. And eventually, you know, you'll go around the pot. We need one here, right? Because we're connecting in. Now we're down here, here, here. Ooh, let's see. Yep, we're in here now and over here. So eventually all these circle lines that I'm drawing here, you know, we'll keep going. They're gonna bump, boop, these, these will join right there. So now I've got this happening. And so they ripple out until they meet each other. And so that would just keep going on and on and on until I filled up the entire pot. Gotta put another circle down here. So I suggest you go around and you put your circles in first and you could just do circles and that's a great starting point. Just give yourself a little, little homework, a little exercise and take a pot and just start making some little circles on it. And then this one, they're gonna bump right there. So you could do lots of circles and you can make them close together. And so that, you could do one, no, we're not gonna do one there because these are gonna be enough. Let's see, that's gonna be here. So there's a little uh, thinking when we're doing our design, you know, you think about where you're putting your lines, but go with this one for a little while. Put another circle here. So carving is very meditative. It's the kind of thing that you slow down for, you don't rush to do, whether it's graffito or Mishima. So I've almost got a good area that we're gonna be able to use to do our inlay. And that's always the most exciting part because that's when the design you've been working on so hard is finally revealed. This is perfect for doodle art. If you do doodles or zen tangles, oh goodness, this will change your life because it's so good for that type of art. 
it lends itself to the casual approach, you know, just kind of responsive and reacting to a line. Just trying to put in a few more petals. Since I started that motif, I want to continue it. Put a circle here. So it's amazing what just one little thing like a circle can do. And you could do squiggles. You know, your circle doesn't have, have to stay a perfect circle. It can get wiggly. This is interesting here because we've got a lot of lines coming together. All right, let's, let's do some inlay. So once you've done this part and your bowl is completely carved, so you can see what we're getting for a pattern, and you can start to see the design coming out there. You're going to want to move on to doing your inlay. So you don't need your foam anymore. And you just pick a color. Um, underglaze, stroke and coat, slip, anything works. I haven't done it with Georgie's Interactive Pigments, surprisingly, but they would work. And you're going to want to thin this down to the consistency of ink. So what I tend to do is because I have multiple bottles of black underglaze in my studio, I have one for brushing on full strength, and then I have watered down ones. So I just keep this bottle watered down at all times. And you can write on the bottles, but you don't have to do it. You can take another container and, and decant some out and work that way. You're going to try it too because you love doodling. So do you need to worry about the rim cracking? If you press too hard, you could crack it, yes. So keep that in mind when you're working. You know, always when we're carving and we're holding our pieces, you want to apply gentle, even pressure to the surface. But um, the carving itself will not cause a crack. All right, so we have our underglaze, and it might be a little thick. The best thing to do is test it by brushing it on. And what you want it to do is you want it to fill in the recessed areas that you carved. And although it's sitting on the surface, it can be a little thinner. Let's thin it a tiny bit more. What will happen is as it dries, you'll notice a lot of it is, pour, is pulling into, into the carved lines. So that's why we use the wax. There you go. I can see how it's pulling a little more. That's what you want. So if it's too thick, you might not get a good fill is the issue. And you can carve and then you can decide you need more lines and go back and carve again and then fill again. You can use multiple colors in one pattern. It would have been really cool if I had decided to do like a purple, blue, black theme and I could have done the center of my circles purple and then radiate out to a deep, deep cobalt blue and then black, right? You just thin down the underglazes and work that way. You can hear tools scratching the clay. Um, you can, yeah, it, they do scratch and you'll hear more scratching as they dry. This is chocolate bar dryness, but it has to go just slightly drier, just slightly drier. It works fine, but you'll notice when you're carving it, and it's not something I can really show, you have to carve it yourself. You'll notice when you're carving that it'll be easier to carve when it's the right dryness. So the only two tools I've used are the L3 and the L2. No, on this piece, yes. I've used all the diamond stylus tools from um, Diamond Core Tools. They have an L2 and a, I think they have an L4. But I have found that just with what I make and how I work, those are the two tools I use the most in my practice. But you might find you really like, there's a, one that's a double-ended ball. So it's instead of, let me get my ball crown. Instead of a ball on one end, teeny tiny ball on one end and a crown on the other, 
you've got two ball ends. So one ball end's a little bigger than the other. So you just gotta check out Diamond Core Tool sights. Can I show you how to carve the inside? Um, I, did I, I waxed the inside of this. We could, we could do a quick little inside carving while that black's drying. So this is waxed inside and out completely because I knew I would have underglaze on my hands and I would be touching the inside of my bowl. And if I wanted to do a, a clear glaze or a translucent glaze, I don't want smears of black underglaze. So to do an inside of a piece, it's not any different really than the outside or doing a flat piece. And I do have a tutorial on doing a tray so we can carve a tray. But you want to support it. You don't ever want the clay floating in the air when you're carving into it like this. You can chip your rim. So make sure you hold it. It's a little difficult because this is wet. And you're just going to, and I don't think the camera will be able to get in to show. Maybe I can turn this way. So you see how I'm supporting it with the foam for the inside. Brush. And I'm not using my not using my plastic. I mean you can go ahead and you can brush into your bucket of water, but now you got wax and clay in your water. And if you plan to reclaim this water, you're not gonna be able to. You can't use that anymore for that. But you just carve down the inside. And it's a little trickier than carving the outside because you're going on the inside of a form. I don't usually carve insides down inside mugs. And I don't usually carve insides of bowls because I like to do, as you'll notice, I mean, you can put chun on the inside and see the carving, but it's a little more obscured. I really like to do a solid colored glaze on the inside, something opaque, and then all my designs on the outside. And I didn't talk about this. This is my patch, one of my patchwork bowl pieces, and it has everything on it for surface decoration. Well, almost everything. Here's graffito. Here's Mishima inlay. That's what we're doing right now. Here's more Mishima inlay. Here's an underglaze decal from Sambao, Mishima inlay. This is a iron oxide decal I made with my laser printer, so you can make your own decals. Again, that's my drawing turned into a decal that I made at home. Uh, Sambao underglaze decal, Scraffito, Mishima, decal, Mishima, Mishima. And you could go further and do screen printing, and you could do all kinds of things, but this is a patchwork bowl. It's got a little bit of everything happening on the surface, and it was really a fun piece to make. I, I did a whole series of these. They take forever. I'm going to tell you, if you do anything like this, um, I don't know if I can justify the cost I'd have to sell these at. I, only so, I did sell some of them because I made so many, and I didn't price them where they should have been, so if you have one of these, you're a lucky duck. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we are. So we're pretty much ready to wipe. And this is where a lot of folks have trouble because, and I know we've run over a little bit, so we're gonna finish up super quick. Because you wipe back with your sponge that's either too wet or you wipe too roughly or too many times. So I'm waiting about five minutes for it to dry. It's got a little sheen to it and that's okay. You just wanna make sure that the underglaze has been able to penetrate the clay and been absorbed. So I've squeezed my sponge out really so well that there's no moisture coming out of it. And we're going to wipe. You're going to hold the sponge in your hand. And you're just going to pull towards yourself like that. And you really don't want to reuse an area that has the black underglaze on it. You want to go to a, a clean area and wipe again. And now I have to rinse my sponge out because it's dirty. So let's start here at the top. It's stained the sponge, but it's not. There's no more underglaze on it. And we'll wipe. If you have an area that a little bit was left behind, you can go back, let it dry a bit, and then go back and wipe that tiny area. And I'll, I'll show you. I've got a tiny bit. The reveal is always like magic. If you're putting your sponge on the surface and water is running on your surface, it's too wet. Just like that. So now we have see. 
Now, if you have an area that's being particularly stubborn and you have to go back in, I suggest you let it dry a bit because the underglaze has now been re-wetted and it'll easily pull out. Let it dry a bit. Again, squeeze your sponge out really well and then I wad it up into a teeny tiny little um, sponge bit. And then like this area right here, you just wipe if you have any areas. And you can do that and go back and check them. And so what the wax has done is it's made it so that wiping back is significantly easier and less product is absorbed to the surface, which saves us money, which is what we want. So this still needs more carving to get finished, but how cool is that going to be? And I'll do, some more, I'll do some more carving on the inside, and I might actually connect the inside carving to the outside pattern. Make sure your water is cold, warm, warm water will dissolve the wax. Not with this, Arlene. This wax doesn't burn out to 100 and like something degrees for this wax, so you don't have to worry. You can use warm water. All right, let me fix Insta. Let's fix Insta so you guys are back up. And there we have it. A little bit of modern Mishima. Uh, now the color, we don't have time for doing the color, and I call that watercolor pottery usually because I use underglaze watered down any company's underglaze you want to do i water it down and then i paint in the paint it in multiple layers to build up color and depth so that takes a long time as well but it's totally worth it you can do this if you're starting out as a shortcut you know go ahead and put some swatches of color on wax it and then just use black when you're carving and then your color's done right and this is a really fun simple pattern so have it Make your own decals. I do have a demo. It's called Making Laser Decals. I teach you how to do not just only put the decal on the surface and fire it, how to use your computer to create your decals with software. So it's everything you need. It's the software part. It's the um, putting them on the surface. I talk about the printers. I give you sources for material, everything. Um, because I want you guys to have all the info. You've had under, some of your underglaze not stay in the grooves and it would keep wiping out. So Lisa, your sponge needs to be very, very wrung out well. You need to make sure you've carved deep enough through that clay so that the underglaze will absorb. Also, again, if your clay is not dry enough, it won't suck the underglaze in. So if you're, you draw, if you're carving on clay that's too wet, it's not going to absorb the underglaze. So you really need to use... Um, you need to think about your timing and work on a clay that's dry enough. I think a lot of people use clay that's too wet. It has to be dry enough to suck that in. That's chocolate, chocolate bar dryness because everything relates to food. All right, so I see some of the wax is coming off. I think you're using a, a wax that's not either not dry enough, your wax isn't dry enough, or it's not the best wax for the job. All right, we've got to wrap up because we do have another demo. We have Strong Arm joining us. We have uh, Catherine Shano and Mark and Carol from Strong Arm. So I can't take any more time, but I'll do more carving for you in live broadcasts as the year progresses. All right, everyone, thanks for learning about modern Mishima. You can learn more about me on jessicaputnamphillips.com. You can also follow me on Instagram, Jess Putnam Phillips, or Clayshare on Instagram, and my YouTube channel, Jess, I think it's Jessica Putnam Phillips is my YouTube channel. You can subscribe to my YouTube. I've got tons of free videos, and all of our live broadcasts are also on YouTube as well. All right, everyone, thanks for joining me.